Today we're going to talk about Gaussian splats in Octane Render 2026.1 Alpha 3. For more insights on neural rendering, definitely check out both the opening keynote from RenderCon 2025, where Jules Erbach breaks down the future of rendering and beyond, and also the one-on-one -on -one interview with Andre Lebrov after. Before diving into Octane splats, let's take a quick look at how they're being used right now. This is an example by Matt Hermans, founder of the Electric Lens Company. Both fidelity and control here are insane, and this is real-time rendering. If you're curious to learn more about how these sequences were made, and you want to know more about the radiance fields in the industry, you can find all of that out at radiancefields.com. Now let's jump into Octane Render 2026.1 and set up your first Gaussian splat. As soon as you jump in, you might see a plain UI and you might feel a little bit intimidated, but you really shouldn't. It's dialed back from your regular DCC without all the bells and whistles, but it's super stable and super efficient. To get started, we need to establish a render target. This is our render container. And if we think of it like a tree, this is the root for everything to branch from. Render clients like the render network will always have an option for you to select the render target. To create a render target, the easiest way is to right click and select render target towards the bottom. This gives us a new render target node, and if we click on it, we get a blank white scene. Everything we do from here will be compiled onto this render target node. First thing I'm gonna do is adjust my resolution. If I click on the resolution dropdown, I can get some presets. From here, I'm gonna to go to the digital broadcast and select HD. From here, we can start building out our scene and adding geometry. And there are different ways to access the contextual menu to select things. You can hit the space bar and you can type it in if you know what you're looking for. Or you can just right click. And if you right click, it's going to open a drop down menu where you can scroll through different categories. So let's right click and go to Geometry, Geometric Primitive. If we link this new geometry node up to the Geometry tab, everything turns slightly gray. If we scroll back out, we'll see it was just the cube occluding the screen. So if we head over to the type and we change it over to plane, everything will be gray again. And if we scroll back out, we'll see just white with a gray plane. I like to keep a plane to serve as a staging area for my Gaussian splats, and you'll find out why later. From here, we can start adding in more geometry or even splats, but we'll realize we only have one geometry tab. So we have to get a group for, to add more geometry. So we'll right click and go back to geometry and we're gonna find geometry group. Once we get a group node, we're gonna go ahead and plug our plane into the first input. And then we're gonna plug that into the geometry channel and nothing should change. But now we have a geometry group that we can add more and more inputs to. To add our first splat, we can hit spacebar and type in splat. Or we can right click, go to all items and see everything, which is overwhelming. Or we can go up to geometry and click on Gaussian splat. Here it opens up a finder window where we can select the splat. And you'll see that the splats are a .ply format. I already have quite a bit to choose from, and I'm gonna include these later so you can try out for yourself. So we're gonna choose this lake house barrel. And once we do, we get a new node for the Gaussian splat. And we're gonna plug this into the geometry group. Once it loads, you have this full Gaussian splat ready to go. If we rotate around, you can see why I used a plane to cut it off. Splats by nature currently don't have a superior way of cleaning them up. So occasionally you'll have some large splat spillage here and there is what I'll call it. If we hover around, I think this is a pretty good splat. It's pretty good fidelity. Everything's baked in, good color. And there are some issues down here below, but we don't have to look at those. We'll hide those. With Octane Standalone, you don't have a viewport. So to transform, rotate, and scale, you can use the key commands W, E, and R, or you can click on the gizmo icons. And this is important because we're going to be moving a lot of things around, including the plane, the geometry, and the Gaussian splats. We're also going to create some instances of the barrel. And we're not going to copy and paste the node itself. We're going to use a placement node. And what the placement node does is it allows us to copy and give an instance, but also have its own transforms. The Gaussian splat node itself doesn't have transforms. So this first placement node we link up to the Gaussian splat and allows us to transform and move it around. Once we get a position to a good spot, we're gonna to go to our geometry group and add two more inputs because we're gonna make two more instances. Then, like I said, we're just gonna copy the placement node two more times because each one of these is its own instance. And now we have full transformabilities on each of these placement nodes. So we can move them around and place them in you know, somewhat of a line and kind of vary things up. So they're rotated a little bit differently. And 
this is where the power of nodal workflows really takes form, because instead of creating more duplicates and placement nodes, we can duplicate entire groups. So now we have an entire line that we can duplicate into another group, and then plug that into a geometry group with a placement node. And we can create lines and lines and lines of these splats. But this is also why it's super important to have these placement nodes, so we can visualize and see them in the 3D viewport, and we don't have to guess where they are incrementally based off units. Nodes can get messy though, so at any given time if we feel like we have too many nodes or it's getting too stringy, we can click on this little button over here, these little icons, and that'll help us tidy up a graph. If at any given time you're curious what an icon does, just hover over and it'll give you a brief description. So now that we know how to set up our Gaussian splats, let's take a look at lighting then, and where Octane really shines. Let's right click and add a simple daylight environment. And then we'll link that up to the environment channel. Immediately things get brighter, because now we have a daylight in the scene. This is the exact same daylight object that's in the DCCs as well. So we can scroll around and find a good latitude and longitude, we can adjust the intensity, we can change the daylight model type even. With default splat settings, no matter how we adjust the lighting, it's going to have little effect on the splat itself. So let's click on the splat node and dive in. At first we're going to see tint, and tint allows us to do exactly that, add a tint of color to the splat, which is really cool. And this actually comes in handy a lot when you're trying to control maybe the white balance or the emotion, just the overall vibe of the scene. This is where we could break the link apart and actually duplicate the splat node. Now we have freedom to change and tint each of the splats independently. And this offers some really cool functionality where we could use them as you know, self-illumination objects in the scene differently with different colors. So let's toggle everything back to white and talk about some of these next parameters. Alpha min, covariance bias, and covariance scale. Alpha min is interesting because every single splat here has a known alpha setting. So this allows us to clamp and set a minimum threshold where nothing below the certain alpha level is visible. And this allows us to break it apart. Next we have covariance settings, covariance bias and covariance scale. Each splat is comprised of thousands or even millions of splat blobs. So these settings allow us to control the scale and we can make them really large and start to break the fidelity of everything and get this painterly effect or we can shrink them and make them very tiny and they'll look like particles, we'll almost have a floating hologram. And this could be a really cool effect, especially if we're trying to animate on or off a Gaussian splat. If we zoom in too, we can see, you know, almost at a particle level, how interesting it is and how many different splats there are. So we can use this to our advantage in many ways. We can set it back to one, but sometimes you might want 1.01, just a little bit extra to fill in some of those gaps. And now we get to one of the most important features, the intensity. And the intensity is the self-illumination itself. So we can use these strategically as light elements themselves in a scene, or we can use them and balance them to a scene, which is really cool. So we have so many different ways we can use these inside Octane. And it's even more important, you learn how to balance the intensity later on. Now we can jump into the important shading parameters. The shadow strength and the shadow ray offset. If we crank the shadows all the way up, everything's black, because we don't have lights in the scene currently. So let's bring our daylight back, and let's scroll around till we find a nice daylight where we get some direct shadowing. So this looks good, and by good I mean it looks terrible. And the reason it looks terrible, yeah, it could be because the shadowing is too harsh, so we can take the strength down from the shadowing, and that'll, you know, that'll make it look slightly better. But the reason is because our lighting mode is set to none. And let's jump into our lighting modes. When our lighting mode is set to none, the intensity value is the only thing self-illuminating each one of these objects. And we can crank the intensity, we can make it stronger, um, and that would increase the intensity, but it's still gonna look pretty bad and out of shape. It doesn't match the scene, really. Um, we can take our shadows back up and it, it just gets harsh again. So we have to kind of define how are we gonna use this effectively and what's the best lighting mode for the situation. So let's jump into our lighting modes. In our lighting mode dropdown, we have the option for power and power and color. Let's choose power first. Immediately everything turns black. And this is because the lighting in the scene isn't really set up and optimized yet. Everything's really dim. So if we go back to our daylight model and we move around and find a better daylight, we start to get more illumination. So we can kind of relight based on what we see now using this power setting. If we go to power and color, we see that the lighting itself is influencing the color of the Gaussian splat, where power was just influencing the luminosity. 
And this is a handy feature because we can use the luminosity at times to power a scene, or we can use the color and the luminosity together. And that just gives us more control. And you may think, well, this still doesn't look realistic. And you're right, because by default, Gaussian Splat Self Shadows is turned off. So if we open up the Object Layer Properties and we enable Shadow Visibility, immediately we get Self Shadows, which is pretty awesome. So now we have full self shading on our Gaussian Splats due to this Shadow Visibility toggle. And by default, this is off. So you have to remember every time that when you bring in a new Gaussian Splat, this needs enabled if you want Self Shadows. Now that we have Self Shadows enabled, we can jump back to the Shadow Strength Controller. This allows us to control the shadow strength of the self shadows as well. We can also jump back to the lighting mode and we could switch just to power. So now we're getting the self shadows from the light, but we're not getting the influence of the color from the light. And you may think we didn't talk about shadow ray offset. What's that? Well, that's the offset that's added to the shadow ray position when tracing Gaussian splat shadows. It can be used to adjust the look of self shadowing Gaussian splats. And yes, I just read that from the description. And this is actually a handy feature and we're going to use it later on. But the advantages really come from a larger splat that has lots of floating splats surrounding. This will allow us sort of a threshold that allows us to clamp some of those splats and bring some of that light back through. In this example, we won't really benefit from using it. So now let's jump into a different stylistic example. And here we can see 3D objects merged with a Gaussian splat and some stylistic lighting included. And this entire scene is actually made on the render network. Using Photon's text to image, I created the visual. And then using Ray2 transforming that image into a 180 orbit to train a Gaussian splat. And for this setup, we have a Gaussian splat, we have two primitive spheres with metallic shaders, we have two analytic lights, and we have a daylight. And this is where things get interesting because we have full spatial fidelity, but there's no real geometry, but we can still go in and we can relight and reset things. So if we go in here and we adjust our lighting mode, we get a really interesting effect where the analytic lights take over and they're lighting the scene in a new way. So now we can start art directing this pre-baked splat and we can add different lighting effects. We can introduce self-shading and make this really unique in different ways. And this is where that balance between self-illumination, self-shading, and all the light surrounding will really influence the way your Gaussian splats look and work, and the way they interact with other objects in the scene as well. So let's take a look at another splat setup. And this splat I captured on my iPhone outside the grocery store in about 20 seconds worth of video. I think this is a really good example of how easy and effortless you can create a splat that looks a little bit advanced but it's pretty simple to capture. It's also important to note that splats are captured from data. If the source data doesn't exist, in this instance, the back of this pail, then you're not gonna have anything there for a high fidelity visualization. But what you do have is about 75 to 80% of the splat being really, really nice and crisp. And that's perfectly fine, depending on what you're using it for. So we'll start off by doing the same thing we did before. We'll add two placement nodes so we can have some additional instances. We're gonna adjust our lighting and get everything set, just a base level. We'll have two additional lights as well. It's incredible how well Octane lights interact with Gaussian splats, even though all the information is already baked. Now if we enable self shadows again, things get really dark. So this is going to be a great example of where we can try and use that shadow ray offset to help mitigate things. Adjusting the shadow strength itself isn't going to get us there. So once we start to incrementally adjust the shadow ray offset just slightly, and then we start to pull the strength down, we'll get a nice balance between the two. And it's all about balance. Once you understand the fundamentals of how to get the Gaussian splat to react the way you want to in your scene, everything comes down to you know, simple 3D efforts after that. Framing, lighting, and your general overall aesthetic principles you use every time. So let's jump into another Gaussian splat scene. This one I captured again on my iPhone just this weekend. What's great about this capture is we stopped and we were grabbing some strawberries from a local farmer's market. So having the ability to capture a Gaussian splat on demand offers incredible opportunities to capture so many things you never would have before and use these assets in these scenes and have full control on 3D. You can see how fast and responsive Octane renders these. You get full visualization with 3D cameras. You can focus where you want with a simple click and you can see the incredible detail without any displacement or any materials or shaders. Personally, I love the possibilities, but also just the opportunity to make these captures with a video format just on my handheld mobile device and keep them and store them for use later. And once you have that content established, you have the world's largest digital camera bag. You have limitless options with the Octane lenses. Let's take a look at one more scene. And we talked about this earlier using the tint feature to kind of establish a different vibe and a different environmental mood. 
So for this, we're going to take an alley. This is going to be a more environmental shot. You can grab this and many other assets online at poly.cam. What's great about this Gaussian splat and this capture are there are so many different assets. And there are so many different textures and materials that we don't have to worry about because they're all baked in. But at the same time, that could be a problem because the lighting is also baked. So let's try to create an evening lit scene and we'll use that directional light as a spotlight. First, let's take the tint and we'll dive into like a dark blue night-like feel. Now to mitigate that white bleed through, all we need is a dark environment. And already it's looking pretty cool. We could say this light streak is moon or something else, but let's try to add a light here and try to match the direction. With an analytic light set to a disc, we're going to try to make a spotlight effect. We can finesse things like the size and the placement later. We just want to roughly get it in the right place now so we can get some shadowing. And once we get it to a pretty good spot, we're going to go into the gauge and splat parameters themselves and we're going to take the shadow strength and we're going to turn it up a little bit. What's great about the analytic light is we can clamp the spread so we can take it down so we can match that light streak a little bit more. Now we can go to the light mode and we can enable power or power and color and we can get a more realistic feel. Once we fine tune that light just a bit more, we can add in our fill and we're just going to use a directional light. And now it's starting to look really cool. Considering this was all baked information, let's add some additional geometry we can use to reflect the scene. And now things are interacting in a really awesome way. We see this really cool shadow from the cube. And let's change it to a sphere and give some subdivisions. Having this 3D geometry integrated this well into this Gaussian splat to me is awesome. We can even enable self shadows like before. And now we get this really grungy effect, which is really cool and it looks and feels like a nightlit scene. Lastly, we'll change the shader over to metallic, just so we can see everything reflect. So hopefully this has been enough information to effectively jumpstart you into Gaussian splats inside Octane 2026.1 Alpha. We'll have plenty more tutorials coming your way for Gaussian splats, and if you're ready to jump in, you can head over to otoy.com and download the latest Alpha version today.